be back out here seeing every one of you. You know, it's kind of like freedom. Boy, um, but let's uh stand and sing. Uh, there is a redeemer. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have, uh, to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that, you, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. Um, let us now sing in Christ alone. Light of the world. 
All right, here we go. So if you're wondering, we had a great time in Florida. How can you not? Uh, Cape Coral is a very unique place. If you ever get a chance to go, I do recommend it. It's built around literally a whole canal system. It's basically the Venice of Florida. Um, it's very interesting. And mom and dad just happen to live on a primary canal. So you're seeing boats going by all the time. It's kind of fun. Um, Please be in prayer for my mother. My dad did get a boat, so, you know. <laughs> no, he's never had one before. So we're all going to wait and see how that all goes, but uh, we have high hopes. Um, it was good to be with them. My brother and his family actually got to join us for part of that time, so we were really blessed. And so we are grateful for it, because we honestly don't know when it'll happen again. So we appreciate you letting us go, because we do understand there was the added gift of just, you know, quarantine, and although I was able to get some work done, it wasn't quite the same. So here we are back. We're going to dig into our second week of a, of a psalm. I want you to think about for just a minute um, something that can be referred to as a measuring stick. I want you in your mind to think about any kind of comparative category, all right? Um, you can think about... Um, your children when they were each born and, you know, the size percentile they were in. Any kind of comparative category that might fit into your head. And then you need to think about this question. What is the deciding factor or factors to measure, compare whatever is being discussed? A measuring stick only works in terms of understanding if you understand what the measurement means. So it doesn't do you any good for someone to say, yeah, it was... 12 inches long if you don't know what an inch is. It doesn't matter to you if you say they're in the 90 percentile if you don't know what that means. So the premise of measurement, just because something might be measured, you still have to understand what the value means. Or without it, you, it, it the measurement itself doesn't really mean much. So I would tell you that this psalm is helping us understand the best measuring stick to the value of one's life. Because I would tell you that humanity as a whole is using the wrong determinative value. And that is the point of this psalm. So let's pray and we'll dig in. Father God, we pray for mercy, we pray for wisdom. We pray that we would have hearts and minds and ears open to wrestling with your truth. We give you thanks for your truth, and we thank you that it is all that we need to know you. And so we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
So if you remember last week, I did challenge you to, it, it takes a little bit of work, it takes a little bit of effort, but do not lose sight of the fact that the Psalms have beautiful poetry that engage the, the, the feeling of uh, our souls, but it also bears deep theological truth. And so part of the wonderful journey of wrestling with any psalm is, is how to keep those in balance. We struggle with the emotive side because there's no music. These are songs, they're poetry. And don't get me wrong, as I said last week, I, I, hey, I have a ton of respect for any of you that get and really get into poetry. You're strange, but I, you know, it's commendable. The other side of that is the deep theological truth is hard to grab sometimes because of the poetry. It's hard to know where imagery is meant to really be grabbed a hold of. So that's what makes the Psalms interesting amongst other things. Here, this Psalm starts with a call to wisdom. It's actually a unique Psalm. Most Psalms are not what you would call wisdom Psalms, meaning they almost sound like if you just read it, it almost sounds a little bit like a proverb which this idea of a wisdom song in this case is furthering the promises we found at the end of chapter 48, where it says in verse 14, uh, that you go to the next generation, that this is God, our God forever and ever, and he will guide us forever. The wisdom of this psalm is a demonstration of that ongoing guidance. It's furthering the promise. I, I just urge you, as you're putting your Bible together, to understand the book of Psalms is not a haphazard scattering of things. Psalm 1 to the end is a very intentional, put-together book. And it's done with a divine purpose of revealing God. So, in this case, we have a continuation from 48 to 49. So, verses 1 through 4 are kind of easy to deal with. I think... You know, you don't have to be a, a poet scholar to grasp that. In verses 1 to 4, it is simply, listen to what is about to be sung. It is a call to listen, to hear. All right? Um, through this song, the sinner, uh, sing, sinner, the singer speaker will impart wisdom to all ages, all economic classes, to all people who will listen. That's what he's telling you. Listen, those Low and high, those rich and poor, all peoples, listen to what I'm about to impart. Um, at this point in the first four verses, the topic of wisdom is yet unknown, but there does seem to be some clues given concerning low and high, rich and poor, at least are possible or gives us a possible sense of what is about to be said. As a wisdom song, this is very important, it shares with the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes a hard-won and enduring faith in Yahweh that rejects any easy or naive assumption of retribution in which wealth, prosperity, and ease of life can be associated with divine blessing for righteous living, while poverty is considered the consequences of sin. One of the most horrible lies that have been going through humanity for all ages concerning God is that God likes you more and he shows it if he gives you lots of stuff. But if he doesn't give you lots of stuff, then God hates you. It is one of the biggest lies that has perpetuated multiple generations, multiple societies, and even today, under the banner of health, wealth, gospel, and other false teachings, this idea that God blesses you and he shows that blessing always through the stuff he gives us. This psalm, among other things, this wisdom psalm is speaking against that idea. Obviously, a psalm that portrays or expresses wisdom is not the norm, I mean, just meaning that it's not classified that way. Um, while we may not normally look for wisdom styled literature in a psalm, it is clear that this particular one does follow the patterns that you see in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So 
as we move forward, I would just tell you this. The goal of the wisdom in this song seems to be out of verse 3, understanding. The psalmist is pointing the, the, the singer or the listener to an understanding. Meaning, as one listens to the song, they will quickly be brought to deep questions of how do I measure my life's worth? This psalm wisdom is given to answer the riddle, as the, as the writer says in verse 4, the riddle, which in biblical terms, in this case, in terms of usage, now let me just help you with that for a minute. Anytime you hear somebody talk about an ancient language or any language usage. So think about Rachel for a minute. When she went to Hungary, it's not simply learning words, okay? Yeah, that's helpful, but then you have to learn how to put them together, okay? And then you have to learn how putting those words together communicate this message. We call those types of things idioms. There are things that we say as Americans in our English language that a foreign speaker may not understand or use. But we do because they're very natural, and that's called usage. We use phrases that we put together a certain way, and our brain just clicks. We get what somebody means by that. So when I talk about usage regarding a word, there are words in the Hebrew language that, depending on context, helps you understand what it means in its context. So here, riddle is not just simply a, a, a fun combination of words to try to trick someone. Here, we have to understand that it's based on topics that require deep insight to resolve. And that's what the psalmist means here which is slowly developed through the rest of the psalm. So verses 1 through 4, the, the writer of the psalm says, Listen to me, I am about to impart wisdom so that you can understand the riddle I'm about to show you. Okay. Now, verses 5 through 20. You can find summarized in verses 12 and 20. Man in his pomp pride, lacks understanding, and will die like beasts. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that would be a great song. Let's just try to sing that, shall we? I mean, obviously, that's one of the things that when you read any of the Psalms, what would it even remotely sound like to music? Now, keep in mind, the pattern of music would have been Hebrew. And Amy, no Amy well enough to know, she would love to know what that sounded like and, and know Hebrew well enough to sing it that way. That would be fun. But I'm just understanding that this is a song. So where's it going? In verses 5 to 6, it tells us, why should I get caught up in fear, frustration, or anxiety when I or others get cheated and some get rich because of that iniquity. Why should I get worked up about that? Why should I get uptight when the rich boast of their wealth? Just because it seems as if the cheating and the rich have it better, why should I fear or be anxious about that? That's how the song, the riddle, begins. The listener of the psalm is being urged to consider, is wealth the most important means, now we're talking about measuring stick, to determine life's worth and importance? Is wealth and glory the only way to see someone's life as full? Good question. So then verses 7 to 9, then because you might start singing this, why should I get uptight when people cheat and get rich out of that? Well, because it's wrong. Yes. But then the, the riddle gets deeper. The, the answer gets fuller. Because obviously in our sense of justice and right and wrong, we see someone cheat. We see people get rich. 
through unrighteous means. Of course that would upset us, right? Why shouldn't it? Verses 7 to 9. First of all, no matter how rich you are, you cannot buy your life from death. The rich will die like anyone else. Their riches gain them nothing in the end, the song said. Regardless of how much wealth they get, regardless of how they get it, it avails them nothing. Now we're starting to get some clarity, like the fog is starting to lift, that this riddle is more than just about See, we would start reading this and we would think this song is going to take us and talk about injustice. <laughs> uh, that this song is telling us and helping us understand that um, don't worry, they'll get theirs in the end. But really, this is talking about life and death. I would urge you, as you're reading any passage, make sure you read its whole context. Because sometimes we start creating conclusions in our head of where something's taking us, and we, we therefore miss when there's a left turn. Because verses 7 to 9 give us a left turn. This isn't going to be about injustice. This is about life and death. This is about what is life about. What's it lived for? Then you get to verses 10 to 11. No matter how much money, intelligence, or land one owns, because keep in mind, back then, land was a huge, significant measuring stick for how wealthy you were. And no matter how much of all of it that you have, the grave is their final home. All the stuff and wealth one owns ends up in someone else's hands. And it says, surely you can see that even the wise die. Verses 13 and 14, the focus now starts shifting from the reliance on money and status to the more deep-rooted issue of reliance upon one's self, which is a very normal, natural human progression. Yes, we might use the elements of money and all the stuff we can acquire with it, but in the end, it's ultimately about what I can do, what I have the ability to control. The proud believe they know or have things figured out. And then what's really funny is that, and, and I'll just use somebody like a Bill Gates for this example. Somebody gets uber amounts of money. And don't get me wrong, they might have shown a great deal of intelligence and ability to acquire it. Whatever the means is, though, what's really funny then is that then that person starts speaking and having a certain glory, a certain prestige because of the money. And then what's even funnier about that is that they start talking about things, whether they really know anything about it or not, and people listen. <laughs> That's what this psalm is talking about that. It's talking about the fact that the proud think they've got things figured out and then other people follow them. But here's why we're really following them. Because they want to believe there is a way to escape and overcome death. If they can figure it out, buy their way out, then why can't I? But friends, the psalmist says, the song says, the path is set. And like sheep, all will follow everyone else to death. So that person with prestige and wealth, they, just like a sheep, follow, bang, they're in the grave. And any that are following them, they're going to end up in the grave too. Nobody escapes that. Nobody can buy their way to avoid the grave. So then verse 15, the beginning of wisdom in Proverbs says is to fear the Lord. Proverbs 9, 10, Psalms 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So 
So therefore, to see one's dependence and need for the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Verse 15 starts to help us see that there's more going on. It says, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. This song offers the simple truth that there is only one who determines the value of a life, who can afford the cost of one's life and soul, and that is the Lord God who will ransom one's soul. The song offers an expression of faith in God being the central figure to all of life. And when one is committed to him, they will know or can know his ransom. The song shifts from verses 1 through 4. Listen to me. I'm imparting understanding to answer the riddle. Verses 5 through 14. Doesn't matter how much you get. It doesn't matter how you get it. In the end, you're still in the grave. The value of life is not determined by a measuring stick of all that you acquire. The value of life is determined by your understanding of your need for God. So then verses 16 to 19 basically is a repeat, a re-emphasizing of verses 5 to 9. Where the truth that no one has to be troubled with the rich and unrighteous seeming like they have it all. For in the end, they will know judgment, death, and their stuff, their wealth will buy them nothing. I can't emphasize that enough. The psalm repeats it because it's really trying to burrow home. Get all you want. That's fine. But just don't fool yourself. Don't lack understanding that it will gain you nothing. All who acquire, they will follow in the steps of those who went before them. The generations, their fathers, it says. No matter how much the rich boast in their wealth, no matter how much status and acclaim others might give someone, in the end, they are still dead, and all they had goes to someone else. That's almost a little sense of humor on God's part. You can acquire all you want, you can buy all you want, you can have all you want, and in the end, it still ends up somebody else's stuff, and they probably get it cheaper than you bought it. <laughs> I mean, it really is interesting. The, the mind things that we sometimes are willing to go through. So then we land this plane on verses 12 and 20. It's kind of like the mini chorus. It is the belief in these empty illusions that reveal the pomp, the pride of men who will still die like the beast of the field. It's the belief mindset of people that if I acquire, if I have, no matter how I get it, just so that I have it, because as if it will gain me something. That's the pomp of people. If I acquire, I can beat, buy out, overcome, whatever, including death. And friends, it doesn't take a genius to hear on various means of, of the electronic stratosphere to know that people are coming up with all kinds of means to prolong life, whether that means, by the way, getting rid of a few people so that there's more for the rest of us, whether that's controlling how many people are born, whether that's controlling how many babies die in the course of a year. There are so many different aspects of controlling using financial resources to prolong one's life. And it demonstrates, verses 12 and 20, the pomp, the pride of men to realize they lack all understanding. And what is that lack? Their need for God. That acquiring isn't the measuring stick of life, but rather knowing God is the measuring stick. In terms of its depth, its value. 
wealth will pass away. We will pass away. It's actually not even the acquirement that's the problem, meaning to have money, to be wealthy, is not the problem. It's actually their mindset that's the problem. Their mindset that any degree of wealth gets you something. But more importantly, the degree of measuring my value over anything other than God and knowing Him, that's the problem. Because it's all going to pass away. The only thing that doesn't pass away is the understanding that being faithful to God, living in his righteousness, is the only thing that lasts. That gives life worth. To believe in the illusions of wealth, glory, especially when one is willing to live an unrighteous life to get them, shows a very short-sighted view of how things work. You're playing the short game. They do not understand the place of God, their need for God, especially in light of eternity. The long game. This is a song of wisdom and hope, helping the singer, the hearer, the reader to understand that to put one's hope and trust in wealth, in glory, and prestige is empty. This isn't about unrighteous acquirement of anything. This, this isn't really about money. This is about how we measure the value of life. To think, to believe, to live as if anything from this world, anything, is so important that I will stake my life on it, is an empty pursuit. Therefore, so is fearing the seeming advancement of the corrupt and wealthy, for it still gains them nothing. Now, I understand that some may respond to that. Well, it helps them now. They can have more stuff now. They have a better life now. And I would simply answer that and say this reveals our lack of understanding in our pomp, in our pride. We uphold this life, the stuff of this world, higher than the righteousness of God, than understanding that living a life centered on God is of more worth and long-term value than any amount of money, stuff, or fame we could acquire now. I, I need you to understand this. It is the difference between understanding that if, if there is something after death, then obviously we need to consider what advances that, what engages that. But if we know for a fact that somebody dies and their bank account gets divvied up to the government or family or whoever, we know they can't take it with them. So then how can that be an adequate measuring stick of the value of life. So, if you believe there is nothing after death, fine. The song, and once again, not just this song, but the scriptures as a whole, is saying there is something after death. And if so, Maybe the understanding of how to engage that matters more long-term than any short-term goals we might have. And let me be clear. I'm not telling you don't have short-term goals. I'm not telling you to be careless with your money. I'm not telling you any of those things. I'm simply trying to help us understand that the singular mindset of what am I living for is what is broken in all people. The scriptures try to show us that there is something better. There is such a strong temptation to like the stuff, the food, the glory, the means to have what we want now. And therefore, we get emotionally distracted by those who have more. 
no matter how they get it. And that distraction then leads us away from the Lord, his truth, and the abundant life he promises. I want you to think about the fact that in my lifetime of 50 years now, I have literally seen uh, a couple of very interesting things. First of all, we have seen an obscene rise in the wealth of Hollywood, sports, and various other celebrity stars, even so-called pastors. We literally have seen in 50 years before I was born, don't get me wrong, there were the few Hollywood stars and sports stars that might have gotten big money, but correct me if I'm wrong, was not Reggie Jackson the first million dollar baseball man? I believe that's true. As much as I despise the Yankees, I do know my history. I believe Reggie Jackson playing for the Yankees was the first, and that was sometime in the 70s. So in the course of that much time, we have seen where the minimum value of the minimum players in most pro sports makes at least $100,000 or more, probably a few hundred thousand dollars in their contracts. And then the superstars make millions. Hollywood, same thing. And what's also interesting, when I was a child, there was a show on, Bill, you can go to the next series, a show called Lifestyles and the Rich and Shameless. How many remember that one? Come on, Phil, working right here. There you go. All right. What that show was, this is before the internet, this is before anything, there was this guy with this really hokey accent, lifestyles of the rich and shameless, and he would talk like this, and then he would just talk about how so-and-so bought this, and look at this person's house, and I mean, I mean, it was a very obnoxious thing. That was the first time that I can tell you where uh, somebody living in Podunk, Kansas, would know what somebody in Uber, Uber Hollywood, or New York would have for a home or a car or whatever. And in my lifetime, we have seen go from that limited source to the fact that right now you could type in a celebrity's name, type in their house, and you would instantly get to see how they live. What's happened in our society is now that we know what they have and how they have it, we all think, why not me? Why can't I have that? Why shouldn't I have that? In my lifetime, we've gone from where only certain people had a cell phone, where everyone deserves to have a cell phone. Where only a few had cable to where now everyone, that's the way to go. Everyone should have cable. Where even basic things are no longer basic, meaning that everyone should be able to have that. Why not me? Because of this shift, that awareness, this revelation has led to a huge rise in a mindset of, I deserve that. And all the while proving the message of this psalm that not only do people acquire the wealth, stuff, and prestige, but then the masses ooh and ah and covet after that life instead of realizing it is empty where it matters. The question is, are we any different? I would tell you I do not have much money or glory, but I have a fulfilling marriage. I have wonderful adult children, a ministry, a job that is full of God's work, and a life full of people I can actually walk life with. Friends, what really matters in this life? Money, stuff, having the means to have it all? Or people, healthy relationships, a hope for eternity? This psalm offers wisdom by giving us a healthy, truth-filled perspective of where money, glory, and stuff all end up. Where do they end up? Someone else's money. Someone else's glory. Someone else's stuff. That's where it ends up. I just end up dead. 
If you're willing, go over to Matthew chapter 6, a passage that we looked at a few months ago. Matthew chapter 6. Here is further wisdom from the Word of God to those who believe in Jesus Christ. Therefore, I tell you, verse 25, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can actually add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we eat? Where? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Unless I put my hope and trust in God, who is the only one who can not only afford the price of my soul and life, but who is the point of the whole story in the first place. Matthew 6 isn't saying that we don't work hard. What Matthew 6 is saying is, look, God provides the means, whether it's the means to work, the means to acquire what you need, not simply want. But Matthew 6 is trying to remind, very similarly to, to Psalm 49, what is the value you hold? And the answer is what God determines for you. God makes you rich. God, knowing God, makes you full. Once again, this is not saying that acquiring the stuff of this world is um, unimportant or, um, or even wrong. It's saying, where is the priority of your mind's focus and heart? What determines the value of a life? Now, another key truth is that compared to much of the existing world and history, I need you to really think about this for a minute. We are the rich. We are contributors to a system of excess and poverty extremes. And while I understand in a culture like ours where there is a quote-unquote class of the uber-wealthy that the first readers of this psalm would not see much difference between our upper class, middle class, and even lower class citizens, meaning our economic culture tends to compare itself to the wealthy, whereas the rest of history has done it compared to those in poverty. We look up as if the rich is what we are to aspire, and by doing so we forget to look behind us and see there is always somebody in need greater than ours. I would caution us, especially in light of any and all political focus on figureheads, supposed leaders, a significant angst with those in positions of power, I would caution us that we do not lose sight of those who are in real need to understand how very blessed we are way beyond our basic needs. We have our needs met, and yes, I would tell you, I understand, much of that is because we work, 
And yet, I need to do my job and remind you who even enables you to work or have a job in the first place. And I would tell you I support Paul's teaching that if one does not work, does not seek to work and earn and contribute, then if that is their choice, they should experience the consequence of their choice. But if there are those who wish to work, to earn, to contribute, then we can and should do all we can to help them, regardless of political views. We help out of the abundance of all the Lord has either given directly to us or the means he has provided to enable us. That's what we give out of. So I close with this. What is a life worth? It is unknown, I would tell you, how deeply a developed understanding the actual writer of this psalm would have had concerning an eternal life and God's role in it. I need you to understand that. And you can see that in the way that he writes some of his phrases. It's a little bit like you die. They're not denying eternity as much as that they're just not talking about what's next. They're simply trying to paint a picture that everyone, the wise, the fool, the rich, the poor, everyone faces death. But God, as he worked through the Spirit to guide the writer, would have a clear sense of eternity. So God gives life worth as soon as he creates it, gives it breath. But more than that, the richness of life for each individual is not found in anything this world can provide or one can acquire. It is found in the understanding, the psalmist says, that God is the center of the story and God offers the only true ransom that enables us to escape an empty life and to escape an eternal death. God is the one with the measuring stick, friends. He's the one who determines what an inch means. God is the one who chooses how life is to be measured, not us. And God is where we will find our measured worth as we follow God, worship God, and serve God's purposes rather than our own. The understanding, according to the psalm, life is measured by our awareness of our need for God, not how much stuff we have. Father, I pray that you would help us to heed the wisdom and the breadth and truth of this psalm, and that we would understand how we measure life and how we look at life is not to be found in anything from this world. It is found in knowing you. So we pray this in the name of Jesus. Um, thinking about uh, the sermon and talking to Dad last night, um, Hearing about the fact that uh, he about all these things and knowing that we're all going to die and it all just kind of sounds hopeless and worthless, but it doesn't end there. Um, for we do have a hope, and that is Christ. Um, and I would like to read the chorus of "Knowing You," um, "Knowing You, Jesus, Knowing You, There is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best." You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. So let us stand and sing um, knowing you.
is to understand that rather than our pomp and what we think we know and what we think we can do and control, it's knowing Jesus that is the greatest thing. So I pray that you would grab a hold of that and may your faith in that, your trust in that, be what gives you hope in each day. Not a politic, not a health code, not anything other than knowing Jesus. That is what gives us what we need to then face all those other things. And so I pray you go home this day encouraged by the truth of God's word. May his name be praised. Amen.